بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back to our courses uh, Today we are going to continue our classes on Structures 2 course and in this lecture we will talk about the third topic of our course uh, The first seven or eight weeks of our uh, spring semester we finished uh, the first topic, which was moment distribution, and then we went to the force method. And today we are going to start the third topic of our uh, course. This will include chapter 14 and chapter 15 and chapter 16 of the textbook. And all of these chapters are talking about a method called the stiffness method. So chapter 14 will talk about trust analysis using the stiffness method. As you are going to see later in another video, chapter 15 will talk about beam analysis using the stiffness method. Then we'll finish by chapter 16 about frame analysis using the stiffness method. Okay, this lecture will include the following main item. 14.1, uh, we'll talk about fundamentals of the stiffness method. Then we use uh, the stiffness method to find member stiffness matrix in the local coordinates. We'll see later what is the local coordinate and what are the global coordinates of the structure. Then from 14.1, this is the member stiffness matrix in the local coordinates of the member. And then we have 14.4 member global stiffness matrix. This is global, so it is in the global coordinates of the structure. So how to transfer from local coordinates to the global coordinates, we have to use this 14.3 displacement and force transformation matrices. We are going to develop some matrices that will help us to transform from local coordinates of the member to the global coordinates of the structure. Then once we get the member global stiffness matrix, we'll be able to move to 14.5 truss stiffness matrix or the whole structural stiffness matrix, then we'll see one example, example 14.1, uh, about uh, how to develop a stiffness matrix of a truss. Once we have this stiffness matrix of the truss, we'll be able to use this stiffness matrix to analyze the structure, to find all displacements, to find all the internal and external reactions. And we are going to talk to take example 14.3, to practice together and to see how to use this method for a uh, real example. Okay, 14.1 is talking about fundamentals of the stiffness method. Okay, what is the stiffness method? It is a displacement method of analysis. What does it mean, displacement method of analysis? If you still remember, we talked about two main methods of analysis, one of them, called displacement methods of analysis. And this is a big category. Under this, under this category, we have different methods such as slope deflection equations, moment distribution, and this stiffness matrix. And there is another category, which is the force method. Force method, this is we already finished and it was in chapter uh, 10. So this method, which is the stiffness method here, it is under the big category of displacement methods of analysis. So it depends on, on finding displacements, unknown displacements. Once we find the displacement, we'll be able to find all the rest, like external reactions, internal forces in the members. If we are talking about beams and frames, uh, we can find also the shear and the bending moment diagrams and so on. So it is a displacement the method of analysis, depending on finding displacements, and once we have the displacements, we'll be able to find all the rest. Also, this method can be used to analyze both statically determinate and indeterminate structures. Okay, so this is not similar to the moment distribution method and the force method. Moment distribution method, force method, slope deflection equations, all these previous three methods, uh, they were only valid, or we can use them for indeterminate structures. But this stiffness method is, can be used for both determinate and indeterminate structures. So it is very general. 
can be used for any type of structures, even also beams, frames, and trusses. Okay, determinant, indeterminate, everything can be done using this method. From this method, we'll be able to find displacements and forces directly. Displacements, I'm talking about vertical or horizontal displacements at nodes. And also, if we are talking about beams and frames, it means also we can find shear and moments. And also the forces, external reaction, internal reaction, and so on. Sorry, for, for frames and beam displacement, it means vertical, horizontal displacement, and rotations. Okay. For forces, it can be external reactions. It can be uh, internal forces in the truss members. It can be also internal forces in the beam or frame element like shear and bending moments. In general, it is much easier to formulate th these matrices or to use this method for computers. Okay, so it is easier to make some programming of computers using this stiffness method. Manual calculation is somehow difficult. It takes time because it has a lot of calculation, but it is a straightforward method and give you a lot of information, all whatever you need. Okay. The application of the stiffness method requires subdividing the structure into a series of finite elements and identifying their endpoints as, as nodes. Okay, let's stop sharing this one and we'll go to opening uh, a white screen and try to write something there. Okay, let's say you have any truss. Okay, let's say, sorry, excuse me for the drawings. If we have a truss like that, okay, we have pin support here, we have another pin support here. Okay, so for this truss, we have how many joints? We have joint number one, we have joint number two, we have joint number three. Okay, so how many elements we have? One, two, three elements. So in this case, the first thing we have to do, we have to divide our structure into some elements. In the trusses, the elements will be the member. So each member in the truss will be an element in the stiffness method. And also the nodes or the joint in the truss will be as nodes. Later on, we'll see that for something like that, for a truss or even for beams or frames, we have to put some numbering. We have to put like node number one, node number two, node number three, member number one, member number two, member number three. Okay, this will come later. So the first thing we should do, we have to divide our structure into some element, finite elements, and we have to ident identify their endpoints as nodes. For trust, it is very easy because the finite elements are represented by each of the members. So each member in the truss will be an element in this method. And the nodes in this stiffness method will be represented by the joints. So any joint in the truss will be a node in the uh, stiffness method. Any member in the truss will be an element or a finite element in this stiffness method, okay? And once we divided our structure or our truss in this case into some elements and some nodes we put in numbering for them we have to find something called for displacement properties of each element okay a relation between the force and the displacement for each element okay and the relation this relation between force and displacement will be called the stiffness matrix okay the stiffness matrix is the matrix that will uh, make a relation between force and displacement. Okay, so we find the force displacement properties for each element, for element number one, for element number two, three, depends on how many elements or how many members we have in our uh, truss. Once we did that, we can combine all of these relations, these stiffness matrices for each element, and we combine all of them to something called the structure stiffness matrix. And we refer to this with the K capital. So the K is a stiffness matrix. We'll see later that we will have something called K small. This is for only one element. And then we have something called K capital, 
and the K capital will be for the whole structure, the whole truss, whole beam, or whole frame. Okay. Most of the time uh, is taken into developing this structural stiffness matrix. Once we have this structural stiffness matrix, everything uh, will be easier. It will be easy to find unknown displacement, unknown forces, and so on. Okay. Once we have this stiffness matrix, we have to find some unknown displacements at the nodes. We'll find them. We'll see together how to do that. Once we found this unknown displacement, we'll be able to use this unknown displacement to find external and internal forces in the structure. Okay. As I told you, external forces could be reactions, for example. Okay. It could be external moments, the reactions that if you have a fixed support in a case of beam or frame, you can find that one also. Internal forces, when I talk about internal forces and thrusts, it means the force in the thrust a member. It could be a tension force or a compression force. If you are talking about beams or frames later on, it means the shear and the bending moment at the ends of the elements. Okay, so the first thing we have to start with is the member stiffness matrix. Member stiffness matrix. Let's assume that we have a member in a truss with any direction, as you can see here. For this member, you will find that we have two axes. X dash, it is the local coordinates in the X direction of the matrix, which is parallel to the member. And we have another axis perpendicular to the member, it's called Y dash. So X dash and Y dash refers to the local coordinates of the member. Okay, later on, we'll have something called X, and we have a force which is Y. These are the global coordinates of the structure. But first, we have to work on the local coordinates of the element, and later on, we'll see how to transform this from the local coordinates to the global coordinates of the structure. Okay, also for each member, we have to define the first node and the last node, or in this case, we'll call it near end and far end. So one node will be called N, it means near end, and the other node will be called F as a far end. You will see later that you can assume which one is the near end, which one is the far end. You can do this yourself, okay, and will not affect your calculations. But if it is given to you directly in the problem, you have just to follow what is given to you. So in this part, we assume that this one is N and this one is F. So we have to get this stiffness matrix. It is very easy. We assume that one end is pin connected and we apply a force parallel to the member because as you know, for truss members, only the force that we have is the force in the same direction of the element, could be tension or compression. So on this free end, okay, we are going to apply a force called the Q. In this chapter, all the forces will be, we'll use a Q as a force, and we'll use a displacement D as for displacement. So Q is for the force, will be Q, and D will be for displacement. So if we assume a force in the right direction of X, the positive direction of X axis is the right direction, if it is opposite to the x-axis, so it will be a negative direction. So we apply a force on this free end called the Q-N, a positive Q-N. So it will result in some displacement here. And we can get a relation between the force and displacement. This is very easy. Q-N equals AE over L times DN. Okay, so the force equals AE over L times the displacement. From this equilibrium, you will find that QN equals QF, but the QF is opposite to the right direction of X axis, so it will be with a negative value. So if QN is AE over L times DN, the QF will be equal to the QN, but will be with a negative value. So it is minus AE over L times DN. Okay, so we assumed one is spin, the other one is free. Let's assume another case also. Okay, in this case, we assume the near end is pin connected and the far end is free. And in this case, we apply another force here. We'll call it Q double dash F because it is at the far end. And it's a positive value. It will result in a displacement called DF. 
So what is the relation between Q double dash SF and DF? Q double dash F equals AE over L times DF, similar to the previous one. AE over L times DF. And again, by making equilibrium in the X dash direction, you'll find that at the near end, we have a reaction called Q double dash N, which is equal to the Q double dash F, but with a negative value. So it will be minus AE over L times DF. In a real truss, you will find that maybe both ends will move because you have a big truss and the whole truss is going to move. So you will have a displacement at the near end and you have a displacement in the far end. So we are going to combine the first one and the second one. Okay, so, and these are the four equations that we have. Now, if you want to find the force at the near end, okay, the QN, you will get the QN from both of these equations. Let's see here if we can draw something. Point options, okay, let's use, okay, let's use this laser. You have Q dash N, a Q double dash N. If you want to get the force at the near end, you get the summation of both of these. So the Q, QN equals AE over L times DN minus AE over L times DF. Okay, and this will be equation 14, number one, the first equation in this chapter. Similar to this one, we are going to get the summation of forces at the far end. We have Q dash and Q double dash, both of them at the far end. It equals AE over L times DF minus AE over L times DN, or let's start by the DN, so it will be minus AE over L times DN plus AE over L times DF, and this will be equation 14, two. Let's move. Okay, these are the two equations that we just developed together. And now we will write them in a matrix form, as you can see here. So we'll take the left one here. It is QN and QF equals, we'll take AE over L outside. Okay, let's go back. I will go out this pointer okay so we have a qn and we have a qf equals take ae over l outside that would be multiplied by one minus one and here minus one 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 minus one minus one one times dn and df Okay, this is the matrix that we have here. For this matrix, again, if you want to check this, if you want to find QN, for example, QN equals what? AE over L times one times DN. So it will be AE over L DN minus AE over L times DF, which will be the first equation. And the second equation will be the same. So this is the matrix form of these two equations. We can write this one as Q small equals K dash times D. What is Q? It is the force in the local coordinates of the member. Equals what? A stiffness matrix of the member in the local coordinates times displacement also again in the local coordinates. So everything in the local coordinates, and this is equation 14, three. What is this K dash? K dash is called the member stiffness matrix in the local coordinates. And what is the value of this matrix? It is AE over L times one minus one minus one, one. This is the K dash. This is the first matrix, a stiffness matrix of a truss member in the local coordinates of the member, okay? But we cannot use this stiffness matrix in the local coordinate to develop the total of the structural stiffness matrix of the whole structure. Why? Because you maybe have a member like this, you have another member in the opposite direction, you have a horizontal one. So how can you get the summation of these in their local coordinates? You have to change the matrix from the local coordinates, which is X dash and Y dash, to a global coordinates X and Y. So X and Y will be the global coordinates of the whole structure. And you have X dash and Y dash for each element. Now we need to transform from these local coordinates to the global coordinates. 
How to do that? We are going to do that using theta x and theta y. Okay. What is theta x and theta y? As you can see here, the theta x is the angle between the member and the x axis. So it's called theta x. The angle between the member and the y axis is called theta y. So we have theta x and we have theta y. What is this arrow here? This arrow, it will tell you which is the near end and which is the far end of the truss element. Okay, the beginning of the arrow, okay, points to the near end. So the near end is at the beginning of this arrow. Z of the arrow refers to the far end. So whenever you have an arrow like this, this will be the near end and this will be the far end. If the arrow is in the opposite direction, okay, let's say if the arrow is like that, this will be the near end and this will be the far end. So you yourself, you will decide which is the near end and which is the far end based on the arrow that you will draw. If in the problem the arrow is given to you, so you don't have any choice in this case, the beginning of the arrow is the near end, the end of the arrow is the far end. Why this is important, you will see later because it will affect our solution, negative and positive values and so on. Okay. So let's assume that we have a truss like this, okay? And we'll talk about this middle diagonal member, okay? For this middle diagonal member, we'll assume that we have an x-axis and y-axis. These are the global coordinates of the structure. And for this member, you have x dash, and of course here you will have another one, which is y dash okay so if the arrow is going to from this point to that point this will be the near end and this will be the far end okay what is the coordinates of this near end it will be x near and y near if this is the origin at this point okay so this will be x near and y near this will be the coordinates here the coordinates of the far end will be x far and y far Okay, what is the theta x? Again, the theta x is the angle from the member to the x axis. So we'll say cosine theta x, and we are going to use cosine theta y. Cosine theta x and cosine theta y, instead of always using cosine theta x and cosine theta y, we refer to this as lambda x and lambda y. So lambda x is cosine theta x and lambda y is cosine theta y. Okay, so what is the cosine theta x here of this length of the member? If you have this is L. Cosine theta L equals what equal? The horizontal distance divided by the length. Okay, cosine and angle equal this adjacent member divided by the diagonal member here. So cosine theta x equals this distance, distance, horizontal distance, which is what? Xf minus xn. X far minus x in here, it will give you this horizontal distance here. If you want to get this cosine theta x equals this horizontal distance divided by the length. If you want to find cosine theta y, again, it equals the vertical distance divided by the diagonal length. So it is very easy. If you know the coordinates of each node here to find cosine theta x and cosine theta y. Okay, let's see this in the coming slide. Again, the same drawing is here with us. And we can see that we have a theta x and a theta y. So if you want to find cosine theta x, which is called lambda x equals what? Equals this horizontal distance, which is x far minus x near divided by L. So x far minus x near divided by L. But how much is this L? This L, we can get it very easily from FISA horse. It equals the horizontal distance square root of horizontal distance square plus vertical distance square, which is horizontal distance x far minus x near square, vertical distance y far minus y near square. Okay, so you can get lambda x, x far minus x near divided by the L. Similar to this, if you want to find lambda y, which is the cosine theta y equals y far minus y near divided by l. So you can see always we start by far minus near. y phi minus y near. x far minus x near. 
So you can see that the importance of knowing which one is far and which one is near. Okay, so x far minus x near in this case, x far minus x near will be a positive value. So the lambda x will be a positive value. But if we assume that this is far end and this is the near end, you will find that x far minus x near will be a negative value. So it should be very careful here in knowing which is the far end and which is the near end. And again, this will be clear when we'll go to a solved example together. Okay, so how to have the displacement transformation matrix? Okay, let's assume that we have a truss, the same truss element. Uh, and this is the near end, and here we have the far end. At the near end, we have two displacements in the global coordinates, d capital in x and d capital in y. If you want to find this value in the local coordinates, displacement in the local coordinates, and if this is d in x, so how much it will be this one? It will be d in x cosine theta x, okay? And again, how much is this one? It will be d in y cosine theta y. So if you want to find the whole displacement in the local coordinate, it will be the summation of the two values here, d in x cosine theta x plus d in y cosine theta y. Same situation will be at the far end. Again, if you have dfx, dfy capital, capital it means in the global coordinate, the main x and y axis, okay? So, if you want to get the component here, it will be dfx cosine theta x, here dfy cosine theta y. Okay, so again, let's do this. We'll again repeat this at the near end. If I want to find the total dn, the displacement at the near end in the local coordinates, it will be the summation of this value and this value, dnx cosine theta x, plus d in y cosine theta y, and this will be this equation. Similar to that one, we can find the dfx cosine theta x and dfy cosine theta y. So the displacement in the local coordinates at the far end equals the component in the global coordinates, dfx cosine theta x plus dfy cosine theta y. Okay, so it is very easy. This will be the two equations that we can use to transform from the local coordinates to the global coordinates. But again, this method, which is the stiffness method, is always dealing with matrices. So we need to write these two equations in a matrix form. Okay, so by assuming that lambda x equal cosine theta x, lambda y cosine theta y, so we can write the previous two equations in this form. dn equals dn x lambda x plus dn y lambda y df equal dfx lambda x plus dfy lambda y. Okay, in a matrix form, we'll take dn and df here. Okay, here we have dnx, dny, dfx, dfy, four values here. And this will be the matrix here. It will be dnx, you have a lambda x. dny, you have lambda y. But in this equation, there is nothing about dfx and dfy, so we'll put 0 and 0. Then in the second equation, df equals something multiplied by dnx. There is no dnx here. It's all, both of them are df and df. So dnx and dny are not existing in this equation, so the value will be 0 and 0. Okay. dfx and dfy, it will be lambda x and lambda y. So this will be equation 14, 7. We can write this equation into this form. D, displacement in the local coordinates equals T capital times D capital. So what is this T capital here, this value here? This matrix is called displacement transformation matrix. Displacement transformation matrix. So using this matrix, I can transform from, from local coordinates to the global coordinates, okay? If I have something in the global coordinates, I can get it in the local coordinates and vice versa. So this is displacement transformation matrix. Remember this one because we are going to use it later, like within a few slides from now. Okay, don't forget that we have displacement and force. 
Okay, at each node, we have displacement and we have force. Displacement is D and force, we call it Q. Okay, so again, similar to what we did with the displacements, we are going to repeat this with the forces. So if I have a force here, Q small as the near end, I will get two components. So this will result in Q capital N X. This one will be equal to Q N cosine theta X. Okay, Q N cosine theta X or Q N lambda X. Q N Y equals Q N cosine theta Y. The same as the far end, Q F small f here. So Q F X equals Q F cosine theta x q f y equal uh, q small f cosine theta y so by replacing cosine theta x and cosine theta y by lambda x and lambda y we can write these four equations into this form q in the x q small n lambda x q in y q small n lambda y okay q capital f x equal q f lambda x q capital f y q f lambda y again we need to write this into a matrix form. These are the four equations that, that we just developed. Okay, we'll write them in a matrix form. So you have QN, QF, X, QN, X, QF, X, QN, Y, Q, okay, QN, X, QN, Y, and QF, X, QF, Y. So you have two forces at the near end. You have another two forces at the far end, and you have only two forces in the global, in the local direction, Q small n, Q small f, okay? So in the global coordinates, you have two components at the near end, two components at the far end, four forces. In the local coordinates, you have only two small forces, Q small n, Q small f, and this will be the matrix that we'll use to get this equation. For example, let's try. Q N X, the first one, how much it will be? It will be lambda X times Q N plus zero times Q F. So it will be Q N times lambda, which is the first equation. And so on. If you want to check Q F Y, Q F Y equals zero times Q N, means zero plus lambda Y times Q F, Q F times lambda Y, the same. So this is the equation. Again, we can write this equation into this shape. It will be Q capital, the forces in the global coordinates equals T transpose times the forces in the local coordinate. What is this T transpose? It is this matrix. This matrix is the transpose of the displacement transformation matrix. So the force transformation matrix is the transpose of the displacement transformation matrix. Okay. So T transpose transforms the two local forces, Q small acting at the ends of the member into four global force component Q capital. This force transformation matrix is the transpose of the displacement transformation matrix. So in 14.3 here, we learned together how to develop the displacement transformation matrix and the force transformation matrix. Now we are ready to develop the member stiffness matrix in the global coordinates. Okay, how to do that? We took together equation 14.3. It was Q small equals K dash times D. Always Q equals the stiffness times displacement. So this equation, it was the equation of the force in the local coordinates equals the stiffness matrix in the local coordinates of the member time displacement in the local coordinates. So everything here was in the local coordinates. We need to change this one from the local coordinates to the global coordinates. It means instead of Q small, I need to use Q capital. And instead of D small, I need to use D capital. How to do that? We have equation D small equals T times D capital, okay? D small is the displacement in the local coordinates equals displacement transformation matrix times D capital. So we are going to take this equation and substitute it into this equation instead of the D. So if we did that, we'll have Q 
equals k dash the same but instead of d i will put the value of t capital d capital okay this will result in equation 14 3 13 okay i this is not the end yes now we have a relation between the forces in the local coordinates and the displacements in the global coordinates. I need still to change this one from the local coordinates to the global coordinates. How can we do that? Okay, we have this equation, 1411. It was in the previous slide, Q capital equal T transpose times Q. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace this Q by this value here. So I will take all this term and put it into this equation. So what is going to result? The result will be Q capital equals T transpose, not to change it, times Q small, but Q small, I will take it and put it here. Okay, so this will be the Q small. So Q capital equals T transpose times K dash times T capital times D. I can write this one into this form, Q capital equals K times D capital. Now, I change it, the forces at the nodes from Q small at the beginning, now it became Q capital. And the D displacement in the local coordinates, it became D capital. And, it's, and instead, instead of K dash, which is the local stiffness matrix, in the in the, or the stiffness matrix of the member in the local coordinates, now it will be K small, which is the stiffness matrix of the member in the global coordinate. But what, how much, what is this k small? k small equals this term here, you can see here, t transpose times k dash times t equals k. So this k small equals t transpose times k dash times t. If we multiply the t transpose times k dash times t, it means the force transformation matrix times the stiffness matrix of the member in the local coordinates, which was AE over L times one minus one minus one one times T displacement transformation matrix. This will result in the stiffness matrix of the member in the global coordinates. Okay, the result of this multiplication will be this equation here. K, the stiffness matrix of the member in the global coordinates, We'll take e, a, e over L outside here, and then we have lambda x square, lambda x, lambda y, minus lambda x square, minus lambda x and lambda y. And keep in your mind that always lambda x is cosine theta x, lambda y is cosine theta y. Sometimes we have something in negative in, inside the equation itself, sometimes it's positive. The good thing in this matrix here, if you take this diagonal here, you will find that it is a symmetric. This value is similar to this value. This value is similar to this value, again, and so on. It is a symmetric matrix. So this is something that will help you to check your answer. You know that the member stiffness matrix should be symmetric. So if it is not symmetric, you know that you have a mistake and you have to go and check there is, could be something wrong in your calculation. Also, there is a very important thing here about this numbering. Always in the numbering, we are going to start with the near end, and then we'll go with the far end. At the near end, you have two values, in the x direction and in the y direction. So we start by nx, ny, near end in x direction, near end at y direction. Then we go to the far end in x direction, far end in y direction. Why we should put this numbering, and we'll see this numbering later on, because you have now the stiffness matrix of one member. And usually the truss you have, it, in, it has many members. The minimum will be two members and can go for like 100 or, or even more members. So how to combine them? We are going to combine them using this numbering here. So we should have some good numbering. We'll see together in an example how to put these numbers. Once you put these numbers in a good way, it will be easy later on to assemble the stiffness matrix of the structure, okay? So you have a truss, which is, let's say, includes different members. Let's say you have a truss like this, okay? We have a support here, and we have another support here or whatever. 
So how many members we have here? One, two, three, four, five members. One, two, three, four, five members. So how many stiffness matrix for, for, for each member or for the whole members will have stiffness matrix for member number one, member number two, stiffness matrix for member number three and four and five. So we'll have five different stiffness matrix one stiffness matrix for each member. We'll call it K1, K2, K3, K4. Okay. Now we need to assemble these matrices into a big matrix, which called the structure stiffness matrix, K capital. Okay. So to do that, we have to find the stiffness matrix of the member in the global coordinates. And this is what we did. Okay. If you ask me, do we need to memorize this one? No, you don't need to memorize this equation here because this will be given to you in the exam or whatever. You, you will have it with you, so you don't need to memorize this. Okay, you will tell me why we took all the previous slides just to understand what we are doing here. Okay, to understand how to develop this matrix, how to understand the fundamentals of a stiffness method. Okay, so this is the stiffness matrix of the member in the global coordinates. The next step will be how to assemble this one into a big matrix. Truss stiffness matrix or the structure stiffness matrix. The structure stiffness matrix will then have an order that will be equal to the highest code number assigned to the truss. What does this mean? Okay, let's go back to this truss for example. At each node here, one, two, three, four nodes or four joints. At each node, how many degrees of freedom we will have? How many displacements you will have? You will have an X direction and Y direction. Okay, so you'll have two displacements here. Then you have another two displacements here, two displacements here. At each node, you will have two displacements. So how much it will be the total degrees of freedom. We are going to refer to displacement at each node as a degree of freedom at each node. So for every truss element, you will have two degrees of freedom. So how much it will be the total number of degrees of freedom in a truss like this? The total number of degrees of freedom equals the number of joints or number of nodes multiplied by two, because at each node you have two degrees of freedom. So two degrees of freedom multiplied by the number of nodes, it will give you eight degrees of freedom. So you will know that the stiffness matrix, this K will be with an order eight times eight because the order of this structure stiffness matrix will be with the same number as the total degrees of freedom of the structure that we have. So depending on how many joints we have in the structure, you will be able to find the, or expect how much it will be the total size of the structure stiffness matrix, okay? The method of assembling the member matrix to form the structure stiffness matrix will be demonstrated using a numerical example. Okay, so don't get worried. We have taken a lot of theoretical things now, and it is usual that at the beginning of any course, things will not be very clear with you, but with using some example, things will be very clear and will understand it very well, okay? This method or this process is somewhat uh, tedious when performed by hand, okay? But it is very easy to do that to program for computer, okay? So in our examples, we'll try to keep uh, the unknown displacement as minimum as we can, the number of truss elements as minimum as we can, just because we are going to do this using hand calculations, manual calculations. So we don't want you to spend too much time in making these manual calculations. Okay, so our first example, it will be example 14.1. And this is the first example in chapter 14 in the textbook. What is required here? It is called determine the structure stiffness matrix for the two member truss as shown. And the AE is constant. Okay, so for this, Truss, we have here two members, okay, one member, a second member. We have nodes, how many nodes or how many joints do we have here? We have joint number one, joint number two, joint number three. 
by the way, numbering of these joints, it is something uh, you can choose it to do it as you want. So here it is given as this is node number one, node number two, node number three, but someone else can assume it in a different way. You can assume this is one, two, three, or one, two, three. It doesn't matter. This is, you can do it as you want, okay? If it is not given to you in the example, you can assume it. At the end, you will find the same answers as like your colleague who assumed something else, okay? But if it is given to you like this in a problem, you just have to keep, if this, this is given to you as one, you keep it as one. Don't change anymore, okay? If something is given to you, just keep it as it is. If it is not given, you can assume it as you want. Okay, let's change this one. Point option, arrow, okay. So let's move. Okay, before going to calculation, let's see together what will be the steps that we should follow in something like this. What is required determines the structural stiffness matrix. Okay, so what should we do? Let's see together. First, notations, like putting some numbering on the joints, on the members, putting degrees of freedom and so on. So what will be the steps here? The first thing is establish the X and Y global coordinate system. Okay, so we have to assume X and Y axis for the structure, okay? The origin of, is usually located at the joint for which the coordinates for all the other joints are positive. So try to put this origin, okay? Let's go back here. Try to put this origin at the left bottom joint of the truss. So all the coordinates of other members will be like a positive. Let's try to write something here. Okay. Uh, let's say you have a truss like this. Okay. Assume that we have a support here. We have another support somewhere here. And then let's draw okay. Let's assume you have a truss like that. Okay. If you have a member here or not, it's okay. This is fine. So if you have a truss like this, where to assume the origin of the x axis and the, uh, the x and y axis intersection point? If you assumed it somewhere here, like if you put it X, okay, sorry for that, and the Y is here, okay, and this is, in this case, this is the origin. It means all the coordinates here, these coordinates, the X value will be with a negative value, minus something, minus something, and so on. So this will create some difficulty in making your calculations, you can get confused, you can make mistakes, and so on. So don't do that. In this case, it is easier to assume that, okay, let's assume here, this will be the y-axis and this will be the x-axis. Let's remove this one and draw it better. We are learning together. No, not that one. Okay, it is this one here. So if we assume the x and the y-axis here, so in this case, this will be the origin. This will be point zero zero. Okay, sorry. Let's write here. Where is the text? This will be zero comma zero. Okay, and in this case, this will be something, let's say three or four zero. This will be positive positive value. All the coordinates here, of all joints will be positive value. This will make it easier for you in your calculations, okay? So this is the first step, where to assume the X and Y axis and the origin. As I told you, try to put it at the left bottom point of the uh, structure, so all the coordinates will be positive, okay? Second point, identify each point and member numerically. So you have, how many nodes here? One, two, three, four, five, six nodes. So you have to put numbering for this. Node number one, node number two, node number three, four, five, six, and so on, okay? 
then you have also to put some numbering for the elements element number one element number two element number three four five and so on so both numbering for points and for elements and you can specify the near and the far end of each member okay how to do that as i told you you can just assume an arrow okay if we assume an arrow like this it means this will be the near end for that member i'm talking about this diagonal this will be the near end this will be the far end if we have here for this another diagonal member the direction that you assumed is like that so this will be the near end this will be the far end and so on if you assume for this vertical one is here so this will be the near end this will be the far end so again this is something optional to you you can do it as you want but if it is given to you in the problem you just have to follow what is given to you based on the direction of the arrow as i told you again the head direction will be the far end the beginning direction of the arrow will be the near end and so on okay so putting the x and y axis making numbering of nodes making numbering of members and putting the direction to know about the near end and the far end this is something you can do it as you want each student can do it as he want if it is not given to you again i'm insisting on that if it is not given to you in the problem if it is given to you you just have to follow what is given to you okay then the last thing you have to define the numbering of degrees of freedom as i told you at any each node here you will have two degrees of freedom we will refer to degrees of freedom by two arrows at each node number one and again number two here or three at each node you will have two degrees of freedom and so on so at this node you have two degrees of freedom another two degrees of freedom and, and so on so how much is the total degrees of freedom here in in this truss okay can you think and tell me let's see together okay again the total number of degrees of freedom equals what equals the number of nodes multiplied by two because at each node we have two degrees of freedom so for this example we will have one two three four five six nodes so six nodes the total number of degrees of freedom will be six times two equals 12 degrees of freedom so you will expect that you will have these numbers these arrows you will have 12 arrows of these two at each node and we are going to put numbering for each degree of freedom let's say number one number two three four five six so until we reach this number of 11 or of 12 okay we reach this number of 12 which is the total number of degrees of freedom but for putting this numbering we have to follow a specific rule we have to start the lowest numbers should be for a known displacement or three degrees of freedom three degrees of freedom at these nodes here let's say at this first node because this is like a pin support so you know that the degrees of freedom here there is there is no displacement in the x direction and one direction because it's a pin support so the displacement here will be zero okay so this we call them these are known displacements however at this node it can move in the horizontal direction it can move in the uh, horizontal or vertical direction the same here the same here the same here so all of these are a known displacement or three degrees of freedom okay at this node here because this is a roller support it can move in the horizontal direction if it can move it means there is displacement there is the displacement but i don't know so it is three degree of freedom unknown displacement so when we are going to make numbering here we have to start with the unknown degrees of freedom like in this member i don't know how much is displacement horizontal and vertical so i can start one two then three four five six seven eight nine because this is not known but the last three the bigger values the highest number to identify the known displacement or constrained degrees of freedom known displacement i know that they are zeros okay so these are known so i expect that the from these 12 the first nine will go to the unknown degrees of freedom and you can 
Between them, you can do it as you want. You can start one to here, or one to here, or one to here, one to, okay, but it should be the unknown degrees of freedom. So start from one until you reach nine, then number 10, 11, and 12 will go for the known displacement, like this could be number nine, and number, or this will be number 10, 11, and 12, okay? Again, it will be clear when we have an example. So we start using the lowest number to identify unknown displacements, and followed by the highest numbers to identify the known displacements. Okay. Let's go out of this. I don't know how to remove this one. Let's see. Okay. For each member, determine. Yes. Once we did this annotation, we bought all of these numbers for the nodes, for the members, for degrees of freedom, and so on. We have to define or to develop the stiffness matrix of each member. Number number one, two, three. Here, how many members do we, do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine members. So it means we have to find nine K small. Nine member stiffness matrix. Okay. For each member, to find the stiffness matrix, we have to find lambda X and lambda Y. And then to find the member stiffness matrix using equation 14, 16, the one that you don't need to memorize because it will be given to you which is AE over L times lambda X square, lambda X, lambda Y, and so on. Okay, I will go back to show it to you. This is the, the one that we have. This is the equation 1416, the stiffness matrix of the member in the local core, the global coordinates. Okay, so for the solution, we have to start with the annotations. I, Let's go back here. Once you have the stiffness matrix of each member, you have to assemble these matrices to form the structure stiffness matrix. Structure stiffness matrix. So to combine all the stiffness matrix of each member to the big matrix, which will be 12 by 12, it will be a matrix of 12 by 12. Okay. And uh, for this, big or a structural stiffness matrix, keep in your mind also that it will be symmetric. It will be a symmetric one. So you have diagonal, anything above the diagonal will be similar to the one under the diagonal. These are the steps that we should follow. So let's say we have this one. I'm going to, I don't know how to keep this one always here to remove these things. Okay, let's remove all of these. So this is the member, the, the structure that we have. It consists of two members. So this is the minimum trust that you will see, only two members. You have three nodes, one, two, three, and as I told you, we can define them as you want, but here we put the numbering one, two, and three dimensions are given here. So what will be the first step? We have to define the X and the Y axis, the coordinates, okay? Let's see. Okay, so this is the x-axis, and this will be the y-axis, okay, global coordinates. Where is the origin of this one? We put it at the end, the left bottom end of the structure, okay? So in this case, this point will be 0, 0. Coordinates of this point will be 0, 0. The coordinates of this point will be 3 and 0, and the coordinates of this Node number one will be x3 and y is four. So you define the numbering, you define the x and y axis in the global coordinates. Then you have to find the coordinates of each node. Then you have to continue numbering. Okay, numbering of the members and the members we usually put the numbers in uh, a square like this to differentiate between the number of the element and the number of the node. Nodes, we always put them in a circle. Members, we put them always in 
uh, a square uh, like this. Okay, but this is not enough. We have also to define the direction of the member. So the direction of the member is here and here like this. So for member number one, where is the near end? The near end will be number two, node number two. And the far end will be the head side, it will be node number three. However, for member number two here, this member number two, the near end will be node number two, and the far end will be node number one. Okay, so keep in mind that the far end is always at the head side, and the near end will be at the beginning of the arrow. Okay, what else we should find? We should also define the degrees of freedom. As I told you, the degrees of freedom equals what? Equals number of nodes, one, two, three nodes, multiplied by two, because at each node we have two degrees of freedom. And as I told you, the lowest numbers should go to the no, no unknown degrees of freedom. So here, at this node, do we have a displacement? You will tell me, no, we don't have a displacement here because this node here has been support, so no X or Y direction. So don't start numbering here. We have to start the numbering with unknown displacement. Let's go to this node. Again, this node is a pin connection, so no displacement X or Y. So don't start with this one. At node number two, yes, this one, it can go down. Yes, it can go down or up. It can go left and right. It can go if this will be like shorter due to the stresses tensile or compressive stresses here. So we can have some displacements here, X and Y. So we have to start numbering with this unknown displacement. So we start with the y direction or with the x direction? No, always start with the x direction and then go to with the y direction. So this will be degree of freedom number one, degree of freedom number two. Then three, four, five, six, it will not affect if you put this three, four, or five, six, or you start here three, four, five, six, because all of them are known displacements. So you can with them as you want but also keep in mind to just to make it easier for you to start with the x and y at each node x and y okay so we started x and y one two then three four five six it could be one two three four five six so these are the numbering again you may have the choice to do it yourself if the problem is given to you only like this so it means you have to put the numbering of the members direction of this you have to put all the numbering of degrees of freedom which are six degrees of freedom some of them are unknown and some of them are known or if it is given to you directly you don't need to do that you just have it you will need only to put the x and y and sometimes again it is given to you so you have only to put this these coordinates of the nodes so this is the first step that you should do once you did this one you have to start getting the stiffness matrix of each member stiffness matrix of member number one and the stiffness matrix of member number two let's see how to do this together member number one where is member number one here and again i will close this one these are the coordinates so for member number one we have to start finding lambda x and lambda y cosine theta x and cosine theta y. If you still remember, lambda x equals what? x far minus x near divided by L. So x far, where is the near? This is the near end because you can see the arrow is going like that. So this is the near end, this is the far end. So it will be x far, three minus x near, which is zero divided by L, which is three. So three minus zero divided by three equals one. Then you have to find lambda y. Lambda y equals what? y far which is zero minus y near which is again zero divided by l divided by three so zero minus zero divided by three equals zero so lambda x equals one lambda y equals zero okay once you did that and you have the l is three meters as you know here three meters so you just you just need to substitute this value into this equation okay so ae keep it outside and take the l inside why i take the l inside this one because you have this member will not be with the same length as this member. So it will be easier to take the L inside. Later on, you don't need to do that because it will be already included for each member the L is inside. So you keep only the AE, which is constant, outside. So let's say lambda x squared divided by L. So 
lambda x square يعني it means 1 square divided by 3 it means 0.333 okay lambda x lambda y anything multiplied by lambda y because lambda y in this equation is 0 so anything with lambda y will be 0 like this one will be 0 here all lambda y all this column will be zeros the last one here because it includes lambda y it will be always zero and the horizontal one here is the second row and the fourth row will be always zeros okay so you will have only like four values the rest are zeros but it's very important to find these values okay these values let's write something here these values are very important okay what are these values if you still remember here it called nx ny fx fy so it refers to the degrees of freedom at the near end in the x and y then at the far end in the next x and y so for this member we are talking about member number one so near end at this point node number two here what are the degrees of freedom x and y nx and ny it is one and two number one and number two this refers to this degrees of freedom here okay number one and number two one two then at the far end we have three and four so we write three and four so one two near x near y far x far y one two three four and the same one two three four so once we did that we finished the stiffness matrix for the first member for member number one we are going to repeat this but for member number two let's go to member number two member number two is here so again for member number two we have to find lambda x and lambda y again lambda x and lambda y lambda x equals what x far minus x near divided by l and this is the near this is the far because this is the arrow okay so this is the far end this is the near end so x far equal three minus x near which is zero divided by l but how much is this l here the l if this is three and this four using Pythagoras theory we'll find square root of three square plus four square it will give you five meters okay so x far three minus zero divided by the l which is five this will give you 0 0.6 lambda y it is y far four meters four minus y near which is zero so four minus zero divided by l equals 0 0.8 and again we are going to close this we are going to substitute these values into this equation okay so ae over l will take the l inside which is five and we put here lambda x square what is lambda x square 0. 0.6 square divided by five so it will give you this value lambda x lambda y divided by l so 0. 0.6 times 0. 0.8 divided by l which is five meters it will give you 0 0.096 and then again here if this is lambda x square this is minus lambda x square so this value will be similar to this value but with a negative value here lambda x lambda y and this is minus lambda x lambda y so it will be the same like this one but is with a negative value then you continue like this now you feel like it is somehow difficult but we'll find it's very easy to assemble something like this because all of them only like three values and you are repeating them this is a three values lambda x square lambda y square and lambda x lambda y okay so if you know these three values divided by l you just fill the values here so my suggestion for you you can here calculate lambda x square divided by l lambda y square divided by l lambda x lambda y divided by l you have the three values and you put them into this uh, this equation here and you will find this one again it is very important to find to talk about these values okay why here it is one two three and four and so on what are these values here these values are the degrees of freedom at the near end nx ny fx fy which is are here okay you can see them here these are the same values so for this member this is the near end. What are the degrees of freedom at the near end? One, two. So we start by one, two. Then the far end, five, six. So always start by x, y, 
x, y, near and far. Okay, so this will be the k2. Okay, this will be k2, and in the previous slide we have k1. Okay, let's just erase these values. Okay, let's move forward. So now, how to assemble the stiffness matrix of the structure? As I told you, the stiffness matrix of the structure will be with how much, uh, what will be the size of this stiffness matrix? Again, it will be six by six Y, because if you will go back, you will have, you know that you have one, two, three nodes. So at each node, you have two degrees of freedom. Therefore, we have, the numbering starting from one and the maximum number is six. So if the maximum number of six, it means the stiffness matrix, the structural stiffness matrix will be six by six. Okay, so this is why here we have it will be six by six. Okay, how to make the numbering? We have K equals K1 plus K2. So K1 and K2, you can assemble them into Put the numbering now in order one, two, three, four, five, six. For the global stiffness matrix, we put the numbering from minimum to maximum, okay? However, for this, we start by the near end X and Y, far in the X and Y. So for example, if you will go to the previous one, you have one, two, three, four, okay? There is no five, six, because for this member, you have only one, two, three, four. Five and six, they are, have no relation with member number one. So if you will go to this one, you will have one, two, three, four, five, six. You can find that five and six, they are zeros. Five and six, they are zeros. This part here is the matrix that we developed for the first member, okay? Then the matrix for the second member, it was one, two, five, six. One, two, five, six, it was this part, this part, this part, and this part here. One, two, five, six, okay? So we need to combine this into uh, a matrix with the numbering is one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's write this together. Okay, text here. This will be one. Then we'll go here, will be number two. We'll go here, it will be three. And this is four. And this is five. And this will be six. Okay, let's make it big. So these are the numbering one, two, three, four, five, six. So what so what should we do here? We should just get the summation of this one and that one. So for example, one one here, it is point three three. And here one one first one column and one row it is point zero seven two. So if you get the summation of point three three, okay, this value point three three with 0 0.072, you will have the value of 0 0.4, 0 0.405, this submission of this one and that one. Then move to the second one, 2, 1, 2 with 1. So you take 2, 1 from here and 2, 1 from here. So 0 plus 0 0.096, it will be 0 0.096. Then 3, 1, 3, 1, you have a value here of point minus point 0.333. And here is zero, so it will be minus point three three three, and so on. Okay, so you can see that all the values here will be the same values except only. I will show you. Let's remove here. Except the values which is in both members. In both members, you have two degrees of freedom, which is contributing in both members, which were these two values. One. 2 with 1, 2. So 1, 2, 1, 2 is 1, 2, 1, 2. Why it is, was like that? If I go back here, I will show you. Here, you can see that member number 1 has degree of freedom 1 and degree of freedom number 2. And again, member number 2, it has the same two degrees of freedom. So the 1 and 2, it appears in member number 1 and appears in member number 2. Therefore, you will have values from K2 and values from K1 as well. Okay, so these values here, it will be a combination of 
from here and from here. Okay, from this point and this point, you get the summation and put here. All the rest will be only in one matrix, not in the second one. So you can put the values directly. And you have to keep in mind again that if this is the diagonal here, okay, anything above the diagonal will be similar to the one under the diagonal because it is a symmetric matrix. Okay, so here, 0 0.097, 0 .09, 0 0.096, 0 0.096, minus 0 0.333, minus 0 0.33, 0, 0, and so on. So the row equals the column. The second row equals the second column. The third row equals the third column, and so on. So once we did that, we finished with determining the stiffness matrix of the structure, which we call it structure stiffness matrix. Okay. After that, we will continue and we'll see how to use this stiffness matrix to determine the displacements unknown displacement, then we can find the external reactions, forces, and the internal forces in the truss elements. So we'll keep this in a coming lecture. I hope that you understand this. I will save this one. I will send it to you so you can check. And if you have any question, you can chat with me. We are going to arrange uh, like a suitable time for like a live chatting or a live uh, contact between us if you have any question or also you can send me by email at any time. Thank you and see you in a coming uh, lecture. Okay. Uh, goodbye.